We know the Christmas story well by now, perhaps too well. We conflate the version we hear in Luke's gospel with the one we hear in Matthew's, weave them both together with lyrics from our beloved Christmas carols, and imagine a once simple and quiet manger suddenly overflowing with visitors, the holy family, of course, but also shepherds and angels and a trio of kings bearing gifts. We've made up entirely the part about Mary riding to the stable on a donkey. That beast appears neither in Matthew nor in Luke. We get the star of Bethlehem in Matthew's account. In Luke, there is no star in the night sky, only angels. In Matthew, there are kings, but no shepherds. In Luke, shepherds, but no kings. We sing, we three kings of Orient are, but neither text tells us just how many wise men there were. Could have been two or maybe twenty. There was no little drummer boy. If we dig deeper than the stories our beloved Christmas carols sing, as beautiful as they all are, we might ask ourselves just exactly what we are commemorating this day, and we would be right so to do. For if we observe it as we ought, this day should impress upon us the holiest of lessons of a life of faith, the Word become flesh. God the Father giving his only begotten Son, and in doing so giving God's very self, That is the unspeakably miraculous mighty force that lies in the manger, the name that is above every name, the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, as the author of the letter to the Hebrews puts it. That is what we celebrate this precious day, that the baby born among God's creatures and lying in a manger is the word of God, the logos, the reason, the name love incarnate. More than a hundred years ago, the English writer Christina Rossetti composed a poem that was later set to music and became a Christmas carol many of us might recognize from our hymnal titled In the Bleak Midwinter. Love came down at Christmas, love all lovely, love divine. Love was born at Christmas, star and angels gave the sign. Worship we the Godhead, love incarnate, Love divine, worship we our Jesus, but wherewith for sacred sign? Love shall be our token, love be yours and love be mine. Love to God and to all, love for plea and gift and sign. Her lyrics have me thinking this year about sign and signal in the Christmas story both in the way it is told in the Gospels and in our response to it. Love was born at Christmas. Star and angels gave the sign. Worship we our Jesus, but wherewith for sacred sign? In technical terms, a sign is a visual or physical object that provides information or direction, like a star hovering over a manger, for instance. A signal is a sound or action that communicates a message or a response. And here we might think of the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, or even an angel announcing the birth of that Savior. In Luke's gospel, the shepherds have the angel's voice. In Matthew, the magi have their guiding star. The star is a sign, the angel's voice a signal. They went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. In this, this will be a sign for you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Because the angels sing, the shepherds rise. They rise up and go to witness the sign announced by the angels' signal, a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And then, then there's John, (laughs) from whom we hear this Christmas morning, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. 
We are meant to hear echoes of Genesis in these opening verses of John's Gospel. The word that was with God from the beginning is not some series of printed letters on a page as we might imagine here and now, but none other than the dynamic speech and breath of God which gave birth to the very world as we know it. At first, there appears to be neither sign nor signal in John's telling of the Incarnation, although he does give us John the Baptizer as a kind of signpost. But a careful reading reveals a very significant one. Receiving Christ and believing in Jesus' name is the primary and overarching sign and signal in the fourth gospel. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. Indeed, we might equally imagine John's opening lines as in the beginning was the sign, or even more rightly, in the beginning was the name, and the name was with God, and the name was God, and the name became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Last night we heard the prophet Isaiah signal that the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, that those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. In Luke's gospel, as we also heard last night, nearby the manger where Jesus was born, there were shepherds living out in the fields who received both sign and signal from an angel of the Lord who appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And we're all familiar with the sign of the star of Bethlehem, which shines out from Matthew's account of Jesus' birth, whose steady light guides the Magi to the Holy Family. In John's Gospel, Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness, the shining glory of the Lord, the bright morning star guiding any who believe in him and his name to behold the grace and truth and glory of God. And whereas in Luke a multitude of the heavenly hosts sing glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth, in John it is humanity itself, we ourselves, who sing such praise. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. It isn't the angels who bring the good news of great joy that will be for all people, but Jesus himself, the Word incarnate, who is and has been and will always be that message from the beginning of all creation. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. In the fourth gospel, signs and signals give way to something even more symbolic. Jesus himself is the symbol of God, the true source to which all signs and signals point. Whether there were shepherds or kings, they were certainly not the only beings concerned in the astonishing gift for which we give thanks this day. There were surely thoughts in heaven, too, which, like starlight, ever sought the earth. That is why the angels sing, why they bowed down with devout gratitude before that divine love which stooped from heaven to lift up the lowly. Witnesses of our redemption, their rejoicing, real, because the reconciliation on earth through Jesus Christ was real and costly and wonderful. The angel saw in the manger a manifestation of the grace and mercy and love of God who is over all, a shining forth of love on this dark earth. And their song rightly began with praise, praise to God, glory to God in the highest, glory to God who has compassion on creation, glory to the one who sends the unimaginable gift to lead humanity back home to God. The Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory. And not only have we seen such glory, we are transformed by it, ourselves becoming children of God, 
who are born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. As theologian Dorothy Lee points out, the symbol of the flesh revealing the divine glory becomes universal because it is first particular. Only now, because God has taken on flesh, can all flesh disclose the glory of God. What is at stake is the reality of our salvation. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased with us in flesh to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. John signals for us that Jesus is the word of God made flesh, who from all eternity was with God and was and is God, the word spoken into the world, the word conceived and fleshed, named from before time and born into the world for us. Oh, what child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch her keeping. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. This day calls us to do the very same, to receive Christ and believe in his name, to guard and sing and rejoice in the gift of grace that is redemption in the incarnation, and then to be both sign and signal, leading others to that gift in God. We ourselves can become shepherds, become heavenly messengers, become like angels, signs and signals to each other and to the world of God's love. Ultimately, what this day tells us is that Christ came down to earth not only to bring us to heaven, but to bring heaven itself to earth, to bring love to earth. And to the extent that we reflect that reality, it becomes real and manifest. Love shall be our token. Love be yours, and love be mine. Love to God and to all. Love for plea and gift and sign.